Sing hallelujah by and by. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, you know, going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. How the ransom singers will together lift that hand. You know, we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Now singing, oh, what joy when we get home. You know, you're going to rest beneath that cloudless stone in that land, in that land where saints never die. We're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. In that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly blend. You know we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Gone will be our gladness, pleasure, there will never end. You know we're going to sing, sing, by and by now singing. Oh, what joy when we get home. Well, you're going to rest beneath that cloudless dome in that land. In that land where saints never die. You know we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Victory and love will be our everlasting thing. You know we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream. You know we're going to sing, sing. What you going to do? By and by now sing. Oh, what joy when we get home. Well, you're going to rest, rest that cloudless storm in that land. In that land where saints never die. You know we're going to sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by now singing. Oh, what joy when we get home. Well, you're going to rest, you're going to rest that cloudless dome in that land. In that land where saints never die. You know we're going to sing, sing, by and by. Amen, amen. Good morning, church. What a glorious day it is to be in the house of the Lord. As you know, today is our Youth Sunday that we have at the end of every month, and we have the pleasure of uh, welcoming back Brother Quavon White. Let's give him up. Let's give him some love. He, he's been away for a few months, but we're glad to have him back here. He's going to go first, but I'm just doing a quick little intro, and I'm going to lead a song for us so we can just get rejuvenated and get ready to hear a couple of messages uh, from God's Word. So at this time, I'm going to lead... I keep falling in love with him. Is that all right? I keep falling in love with him. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and blessing me over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and blessing me over and over and over again. 
He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. Keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Good morning, church. I'm super excited to be up here again today to be able to proclaim another portion of God's word on this beautiful youth Sunday. Me and Noah, we have some powerful and impactful words for you guys today. And just super excited, especially to the leadership. Just thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to be able to become, to come in front of you guys and to be able to proclaim another proportion of God's word on today. We also just want to be prayerful for Brother Newton, as we know he's away right now speaking somewhere else. Just want to be prayerful for him and his family that they're also able to make it back here safely and be with us at the next appointed time. And it's just my hope today that both words that me and Noah bring to you guys today will be encouraging and uplifting to you all also. So for my portion of this lesson today, we'll be coming out of Genesis chapter 45, and we'll be coming from verses 5 through 8 for focus. And I'll read it again for emphasis sake. And it reads, And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you, who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. So leading up to this moment, as we see Joseph here in speaking, Joseph, he's at this point where he's beginning to reveal himself to his brothers. So leading up to this moment, his brothers have done what some would deem the unforgivable. Joseph's father who found favor in Joseph He was tricked into believing that his beloved son, Joseph, his baby boy, Joseph, was killed by an animal. When in actuality, the envy of Joseph's brothers led to them plotting to fake his death and to sell him into slavery. And after his brothers sold him, he finds himself in a whirlwind of events. He finds himself in a couple different sticky situations, which goes from him being enslaved to him going to prison and then to him ultimately becoming second in command in Egypt and delivering them from a famine. So the beginning and end of these stories are true testaments to who God is and why it's important to acknowledge who God is through everyday life. With the blessing of God, all things are possible. Which brings us to our lesson title for today, The End of the Beginning. The End of the Beginning. So while navigating through life, we find ourselves in many situations where we may feel as though that our end is near. And when I say that our end is near, it doesn't always mean that your life is over. It doesn't mean that God has called you home just yet, but meaning that you may feel as though you've peaked. And when we say peaked, you may feel some regression in your life. In some cases, you may feel some standstill in progress. You were on a high at one point. You know, God was good, but now those hard times then fell on you and you're a little more quiet during worship service. You might not sing as loud as you used to. You know, your prayer life may have faltered a little bit. We used to see you every every event, every class, but now you're missing classes and we're not seeing you as much. You may feel as though you've reached your end, but I'm here to tell you today, don't close your own chapters in God's book. We read over in Romans chapter eight, it says God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. We see time after time in scripture where people have made something happen out of nothing with the help of God. 
time after time where people have been in situations where they couldn't see the outcome or how the story ended. And that's something super important to note when you're reading these various stories. We often make the assumption when we read these Bible stories that it's easy to be in those situations because we can see how the story ends. But I'm here to tell you today, in those Bible stories, they didn't know how those stories ended. There's a lot of different ways that things could have been, but they had faith and they believed that regardless of the outcome, God would bring them through. We can't allow from others to deter our faith from God. Joseph could have used this as a reason to lose faith. When he was sold off to his brothers, he could have used that as a reason of faith and fell off on his walk with God, but he didn't. He instead stayed the course in knowing that in the end, victory and blessings awaited him. Joseph had some faith that we shall all be striving to have one day. There's so many examples of those in the Bible acknowledging who Jesus is. We saw Peter walk on water due to his acknowledgement of who Jesus was. We see the woman with the issue of blood who was plagued by this for 12 long years. And because she acknowledged who Jesus was, she was fully healed. We see Daniel and the three Hebrew boys acknowledge who Jesus was when decrees were made in their homelands that were made against God and that they couldn't serve God. And during that time, they did not veer away from God, but instead got closer to him in believing that God would save them from the situations that they were put into due to their faith. We see Samson, when he betrayed God for a woman, he let the secret to his strength be known. And when his hair was cut and he was weakened and he was detained and he was tied up and he was put on display for the Philistines to make fun of him and to mock him, he prayed to God and acknowledged the mistake that he made. And God granted him with the power to rule over his enemies just one more time when he was able to push those pillars over and to kill those thousands of Philistines that were there in that time. We see from David, when David goes to bring his brother's food, he sees this tall giant Goliath talking down on God. And David, acknowledging who God is, he said, we can't stand for this. We can't stand and let this man mock here and not acknowledge who God is. And this ultimately led to him slaying Goliath during that time. We see Elijah the prophet. He stood alone and challenged 450 prophets of Baal to see whose God would answer first and rain down fire on the altar. We see the woman at the well who acknowledged also who Jesus was. When she encouraged, when she encountered him at the well, he told her some things about her and told her what she needed to do. And her first instinct was to run back and tell everyone that there's this man named Jesus and you need to go see what he's about. We see Moses. When Moses is leading the people from Pharaoh and they get to the river and the, um, Pharaoh's army is closing in and there's a whole huge body of water in front of you, they're complaining. They're saying, nah, Moses, you let us here to die. You gave us some false hope. You let us here and now we're going to be back enslaved right where we started at. And it took Moses to acknowledge who Jesus was. And he listened when God told him, stretch his rod out. And God divided those seas and they walked out on dry land. And the list just goes on and on and on of people in the Bible acknowledging who Jesus was. So these stories, they're all so strong because they show us that there's hope in every situation. Even in the midst of a lot of darkness, even in the midst of hills and valleys, there's always hope. It's important to know that because there's hope in every situation, God doesn't allow certain things to happen to us. So we see when we fall in certain situations, especially looking in the Bible, God allowed Peter to sink in the water, but Peter didn't drown. God allowed Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den, but he wasn't eaten alive. God also allowed the three Hebrew boys to be thrown into the fiery furnace, but they weren't devoured by the fire. God also allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery and then to be jailed, but in the end, he came out a king. Your current situation isn't your end point or a set destination. It's important to always let God use you in every situation that you may be put into. We assume because there's certain situations or certain times we fall short that we can't be used for the edification of God's glory. When nowhere in scripture has that ever been the case. Time after time, we see flawed people coming together to be used for the perfection of God's word. We mix assumptions with truth. 
Assumptions are things we accept without proof. Assumptions are the death of truths. If we assume God can't use us to certain cap capacities, we've already limited ourselves in the power that God has. Satan wants us to assume that we can't be used. He wants us to assume that we're too far gone to come back to God, but you can never be too far from God where he can't reach you. God's not looking for the smoothest talker. He's not looking for the most educated. He's not looking for the wealthiest person. He's not looking for the nicest car. He's not looking for the biggest family. He's not looking for the biggest house. What God's looking for is the biggest heart. He's looking for the one that's willing to serve. All he needs is a heart that's willing and he'll make the rest happen. Satan will make you believe that you have to step away from God and stop coming to church to get your life together. We've all experienced something along the lines of this. You know, we say, you know, we're going through a situation at time and we say we need time to go get it together. You gotta go home, you gotta go think on it, dwell on it, whatever the case may be. But we find ourselves stepping away from church to some extent when we fall into certain situations. Where we said, so we say that the church is a hospital, right? So if the church is a hospital and looking at it from a physical perspective of what a hospital is, people go to the hospital when they're sick or when they're physically, mentally, or whatever the case may be, when they're enabled, they go to the hospital for betterment. So if it was possible to get better without going to the hospital, a lot of people would be out of jobs. And when I say a lot of people would be out of jobs, if we could get better on our own, there'd be no reason for the hospital at all. If it was possible, why would we ever think spiritually that we're able to get together without the help of the spiritual hospital here? There's this misconception of a lot of things that goes on. And there's a lot of misconceptions that with, um, that with Christianity, after you get baptized, it's supposed to be sunshine and rainbows. You know, after you get baptized, you give your life to God, everything's gonna be good. And you know, you all, God ought to protect you from everything, you ought not go through nothing, you know, no hills, valleys, you know, it's supposed to be a smooth ride after you get baptized. But I'm here to tell you, that is the furthest thing from true. We read over in Romans 5, it says not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So let me give you an example of not letting your current situation define who you are. So about two to three years ago, we were in the middle of what seemed to be the end of the world. So when I say the end of the world, we were in a pandemic. This was something that most of us, right, haven't seen before. So when I say this is something we haven't seen before, we weren't able to come together in the church building. Schools were closed. The grocery store was closed. There were a lot of things that was closed and a lot of things that we were used to every day that changed from that day. We started and those times were rough. We switched over to an online service. We had EJ, he was leading songs out his living room. His family was his background singers. We had Brother Newton, he was sweating out in his living room, delivering that word. We had X, he was giving us that scripture reading with one eye open, laying down in his bed. And then we had me. I'm out there on the porch with my nice little zip up church sweater with those pajama bottoms on, giving y'all that call to worship. So it, it was a time. Then, some things switched over. Then we made a step forward and we moved on from that. So then there was the point in time where we, we kind of sort of made it into the building. It wasn't the thing that we were used to yet, but it was me and it was EJ and it was Brother Newton and it was Brother Stewart and we was in here. We had a nice camera right here set up. It was right here aimed on us and we led a whole service to an empty building. So an empty building no chairs, nothing at all, just EJ singing on the mic again. Brother Newman was kind of helping him with a little bass, but it was pretty quiet in here. And it was something that we've never, ever seen before. But there were some people who didn't let that situation define the time and to let that time be the end for us. 
there were some people that didn't let that be the end of the New Haven Church of Christ. There's a lot of churches that didn't make it through that time. But there were some people out here, and all of us in here, that didn't let that situation define who we are. Our media ministry is stronger than ever now that we went through that pandemic. There's so much to gain from every situation that we're tested with. God has truly blessed us as a church family to be able to get back to where we are today. So as I get ready to transfer the mic over to Noah, he's gonna give us some more words of encouragement. I just want us, especially young people, to understand that being a Christian, it never exempts you from hard things in life. Nor does it exempt you from going through things also. One of the biggest misconceptions of being a Christian is that things get easier. Life gets easier. Being a Christian doesn't in any circumstance make life easier for you. But what it does, it changes how you handle and you deal with things. I challenge you today to alter your mindset when dealing with the bumps and roadblocks that we face in life, we're gonna be challenged every day. And life's gonna throw some feathers at us, but along with those feathers, life's gonna throw some bricks at us. But we must remember that there's always, and there's always purpose in our lives, but we must truly be striving to make heaven our everlasting home. Thank you. Amen, amen. Let's give one more love deposit to Brother Quavon White. Outstanding, outstanding message, and it's good to have him back in the pulpit. Good morning once again, church. Um, as I begin to talk about my lessons, there's many parallels between what Quavon was talking about and what I have to bring to you on this morning. He's telling a message about as how Christians, our lives don't become easier once we become saved. Right, we still face many challenges. There are many valleys that we enter when we don't know how to climb our way out of, right? I'm speaking from personal experience. I'm going through a period of life that I've never gone through before. I'm about to get married in one month. And let me tell you, it's been, it's been exciting. It's been thrilling, it's been gratifying. It's also been extremely challenging. It's been stressful. I've cried at times, I'll be honest with you. And I've gone to the Lord and I've said, God, please lead me. I don't know which way to turn. What do I do? And at times when I was looking to hear God's voice, what I heard instead was Satan's voice disguised as the Lord's. Has anyone been in that situation before? You're looking for guidance. You're looking to do the right thing and you think you're on the right path, but you look up and you, you realize you're somewhere you didn't even plan to go because you were listening to the wrong voice. And so on this morning, the title of this lesson is, Are You Really Listening? Ask yourself, church, are you really listening? Because there are going to be times where you need to listen and adhere to the voice of God. And so it's so important that we know how to discern between when God is speaking to us versus when Satan is speaking to us. Amen? And so as we dive into the lesson, where better to start than at the beginning with Adam and Eve? So we know that in chapter 2 of Genesis, beginning at verse 15, the Lord gives a direct command to Adam. He says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And then in the very next chapter, we're introduced to Satan in the form of the serpent, who, depending on what you're reading, what version you're reading, is described as the most cunning, the most crafty, and the most shrewd or sharp-witted animal that the Lord had ever created. And so before we even get to the first interaction between human and serpent, we can already see that Satan ain't nothing to play with. He's cunning. He's crafty. I don't care how clever you think you are. I don't care how smart you think you are. I don't care how well prepared you think you are for the future. Let me tell you, Satan is more, and he's five, ten times ahead of you. Okay? And so we see, because of this, how easily he disarms Eve's mind and actions in the following verses when he convinces her and Adam that if they eat from this fruit, 
then they will obtain eternal life, they'll never die, and that they will be like God. And look how harmless it seemed. It wasn't like Satan was saying, look, Eve, I want you to go out and kill Adam. Or I want you to go and curse God's name or worship false idols. It was as innocent as using desires that we all have, the desire for knowledge and wisdom. And so, church, this brings me to my first point. Satan will use your own desires against you, even if what you desire is not inherently wrong or evil. Let me say that one more time. Satan will use your desires against you, even if what you desire is not inherently wrong or evil. And you may ask me, Brother Reed, well, what does that look like in today's day and age? Because ain't no walking, talking serpents going around whispering in our ears, telling us to eat of some powerful fruit. And so let me just break it down for you in a few ways. Money, recognition, pleasure, knowledge itself. I'll start with money as an example. Money is something that we all need. It's something that we need to, to pay the bills. It's something that we need to eat, to provide a roof over our heads, to provide for our loved ones, right? There's nothing wrong with wanting or desiring money. Or let's talk about pleasure, sexual pleasure. There's nothing wrong with sexual pleasure in the confines of a marriage, of course. There are other types of pleasure, however, right? Everyone has their favorite dessert, their favorite food, and that gives us a sense of pleasure, a sense of enjoyment. Everyone has their favorite TV show, their favorite sports team that you like to watch, and when they win, I'll bet you that gives you a feeling of great pleasure, right? I'll talk about myself, knowledge itself, right? There are many students at this church, many people aspiring to, to acquire knowledge, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. However, it only becomes wrong when these desires become the God that we serve, because that's what Satan wants us to do. Satan will slip into our ear and say, look, if you just skip Sunday this time so you can study for that exam, then I promise I'll give you everything you want. He says, if you just, instead of going to church on Sunday, you spend a little more time on the job and you spend a little bit more time making that money, I promise I'm gonna give you that house you want. I'm gonna give you that car that you want. And before we know, we've created a false idol. And what am I trying to tell you, church? We are more like Adam and Eve than we care to realize. Because it's funny, as a, as a kid, I would read that story of Adam and Eve, and I would get angry. I would get frustrated. I'm like, this fool. You know what I'm saying? These fools, man. God gave them a direct command. All they had to do was obey. And here they are eating of the fruit they wasn't supposed to eat of. If that was me, I wouldn't have done that. But time and time again, we see that as humans, we often fall prey to our own desires. As Satan tempts us with those things that may not be harmful inherently, but they become harmful when we put them in the place of God, right? And so we see that Satan is a force that inspires doubt and causes us to question God and his power. And the more we listen to his voice, the less we're able to hear and adhere to the voice of God. Let's bring it back to Adam and Eve again, doubting God's command. By doubting what God had commanded, they were also doubting God's stance as being ruler and holding all power. And it's sad because God had given them everything they needed, everything they could have wanted. Look at James chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But... But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. And I'm here to tell you, church, that many times we are unstable and double-minded in the things that we do because God has given us what we need. He's told us how to get what we want. But oftentimes we go outward we go to those desires, we go to those sources that we ought not go to, and when, when God sees that, he's just seeing another replica of Adam and Eve. And so doubt inspired through the devil's voice plays out in other ways as well. Often, this is in the form of self-doubt. Self-doubt. I think it's important for the youth to hear this as well as they're being bombarded and inundated with all of these messages that are saying you're not worthy. You don't have value. 
you're not able to accomplish the goals and the aspirations that you set for yourself, your own identity is in question in this day and age. I'll tell a, a personal story about when I was applying to grad school. I'm in the, going into the third year of my PhD program right now. And when I was applying to grad school a few years ago, I was going to uh, a professor at my university. Her name is Dr. Smallman. I was going to her for uh, advice and assistance with my graduate school applications. And she told me numerous times, this is a real story. She told me numerous times, Noah, you need to aim lower. The schools on your list are probably outside of your reach. And I think you need to aim lower. You know, sure, you've, you've, you've done well. Your grades are, are great. You've done a lot of extracurriculars. But you know, I just feel like you should aim lower. And then she said, well, in regards to where I'm at right now, Yale, she said, don't apply to Yale. You're too nice. And if you go to Yale, they'll walk all over you, and you won't be successful. That's what she told me numerous times when I told her I wanted to get into this school. And I'll tell you what, I began to doubt. I began to think, well, you know, I thought I was qualified, but maybe she's right. What if she's right? Should I really be applying to these schools? Do I have a chance of getting in? And I began to doubt. But I'm here to tell you, 2 Timothy, beginning at verse 1, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so I realized that this spirit that was filling me of fear and doubt was not coming from God. The person who was supposed to help me, Dr. Smallman, was actually allowing Satan to use her. And so in, in, in reality, what I was not hearing was the voice of God, but instead it was the voice of Satan trying to cause me to doubt. Because guess what? He knew that if I ended up here in New Haven, then I would be up here on Sundays speaking to all of you. I would be going to other congregations and preaching. I would find my fiance and my future wife here, and, and we would create a great work together where we can both serve the kingdom and, and, and edify each other spiritually. Amen? He saw that, and he wanted to stop that. So he said, here, Dr. Smallman, tell him this, right? And so we have to be careful about the voices that we listen to because the people who are trying to help us are not always trying to help us, right? It goes even deeper however, than simply these outside forces or people who would wish to see us fail. I mentioned earlier how the Bible refers to Satan as the most cunning and crafty creature ever created. It also describes him as, an angel, as, a, as a person or as one who masquerades as an angel of light. It also describes him as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in several places, Satan is described as the prince or ruler of this world. Therefore, if, the, if Satan is as powerful as the Bible says, and if he's able to disguise himself as an angel of light, a force of good, then who better to be used by him than the people who you love, the people who you trust, the people who are closest to you? Amen? Meaning, don't think for a single second that he won't use your spouse, that he won't use your best friend, that he won't use your brother or your sister, or even your father or your mother, or your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Right? I think one way to really draw this out through Scripture is in the verse that was read to us prior. Actually, we didn't read this verse prior, so this will be the first time. So this is the verse. It will be coming from Matthew chapter 16 beginning at verse 21. Matthew 16, beginning verse 21. And it lays this, this, this out nicely for us. It reads, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, Never, Lord! This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Or in the New Living Translation, Jesus turns to Peter and says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. And so we need to understand Peter as most of you know, was one of the 12 disciples. So he wasn't just any random tax collector or religious leader. Like, no, this was someone 
in the inner circle. He was one of the people on the earth that was closest to Jesus. And we know that, you know, it's easy to see Peter didn't have ill intentions for Jesus. He simply didn't want Jesus to go through the suffering that he was about to go through. And that's why he said, no, man, this, this, is, this won't happen to you. So why would Jesus respond so, so harshly, so aggressively? Because I, when I, when the first time I read this, I was like, wow, that was a, kind of an extreme response. Jesus, you call him Satan. Well, we have to understand, Jesus had been given the most important job that any human on the earth had ever been given, to cleanse us and to die for our sins, correct? And he knew that if anything was to get in his mind, any level of doubt, any level of fear, anything that would cause him to backtrack on the purpose that had been laid out for his life, he would need to get away from that. He would need to flee from that. So he's saying, man, get behind me. I can't afford to doubt. I can't afford to backtrack on this purpose that God has for my life. And even though you might be trying to do well for me, you are allowing Satan to use you because Satan doesn't want me to carry out this plan. So he's saying, get behind me. And so what am I saying? The people close to us, sometimes even though they want what's best for us, they don't always know what's best for us. There have been many times in this journey of getting married, of engagement, that I've made mistakes and I've gone to loved ones, people who are already married, others who are older than me for advice. And these people were genuinely trying to give me good advice. However, they didn't know what was best for me. So when I took that advice, sometimes it made the problem worse. And I had to realize that sometimes Satan will use those people who are closest to you without them knowing it. It doesn't always have to be some sinister uh, you know, secret that they're holding and they're plotting against you. It can be as simple as your brother or your sister creating an argument and causing you to get angry and sin. It can be as simple, though, simple as your parents or your grandparents giving you advice and that advice leading you down the wrong path. So we have to be careful about who we listen to because sometimes that's not the voice of God. And in fact, sometimes it is the voice of Satan. And so as Christians, it's our job to be vigilant and sober minded. Meaning we have to be on guard at all times and be aware of the fact that Satan will not likely attack you with that frontal assault, but instead with schemes that are much more inconspicuous and under the radar. This also means we have to be well protected when we go out. And it doesn't matter if we're interacting with our loved ones or complete strangers, we have to be well protected at all times. I like the way it's illustrated in the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer who had been allowed to go back to Jerusalem where the, uh, the wall had been torn down. And he's allowed to lead this initiative of rebuilding the wall. And so we see in Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, it says, Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves. So with one hand, they worked at the construction, and with the other hand, they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built and so at this time, the, these people who are building the wall, working to rebuild the wall, they're facing a physical threat of death. And so they know there are people who would wish to see them fail at this task of rebuilding the wall, so they must protect themselves. So even though they have a job to do, which is rebuilding the wall, they also know that they need to protect themselves because at any moment, at any moment, things could go south. This is the type of mindset that we have to have when we go out into the world and we interact with anyone, our loved ones, Strangers, we have to be on guard because Satan will use anything to get to you. And it starts like this. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a piece of an, an object, right, that has a crack in it. And water starts to seep through it. And that crack, the moment, you know, it sees that opening, it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And before we know it, there's a wide gaping hole because Satan used that little, little thing that we weren't even paying attention to, right, to get to us. So we have to be on guard. This is why we have to have the full armor of God to protect ourselves because Satan, he's prowling like a roaring lion, right? And so the title of this lesson, Are You Really Listening This Morning? In order to hear God, we must lean on him. Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 5, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean on your own understanding, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways submit to him or acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 
And so you see, there's a reason why we can't lean on our own understanding. That was the problem with Peter. Peter was relying on his own understanding and said, you have human concerns. That's what, that's what Jesus told him. When we rely on our own understanding, we are relying on our flesh. And if we're relying on our flesh, that means we're relying on the world. And who controls this? Who, who did it say is the prince or the ruler of this world? Satan. Therefore, if you are relying on your own understanding, you're actually relying on Satan. You see what I'm saying? And we cannot serve two masters. So if you're not serving God and you're leaning on your own understanding, you are, in fact, serving Satan. It doesn't have to be a conscious thing for it to be happening, right? In our efforts to secure our desires as well, we must make sure that it is God who we submit to. Because as I said before, if we submit to those desires, then we're putting those desires in place of the God that we ought to be serving. It goes further that in James chapter 1, beginning at verse 19, that we must be slow to speak, yet quick to listen. And so if you can't hear God on this morning, it might be because you're talking too much. And you might need to just slow down and listen, because if we're speaking, then how can we hear the voice that should be leading us? Amen? So we have to be slow to speak and quick to listen. We also must fight against this self-doubt. Like I said, many, many of us on this day and age, not just the youth, but the older people as well, face self-doubt. You know, I think I thought when I got to a certain age, I, was, I would have like this unlimited level, level of confidence and assuredness, but that simply is not the case. My own mother and father who are, you know, my, my dad, he's in his 60s. He's still saying, he's still asking, did I do that right? Am I doing this the right way? Am I being valued in this way? Right, these voices, these negative voices do not cease to stop. And so we have to continuously fight against self-doubt. That means that you are not too dirty for, for God to cleanse. That means that you are not too far for God to reach. You are not too broken for God to fix. You are not too lost for God to find. But this is what Satan wants you to believe. And if you were here on this morning, you're trying to do the right thing you're trying to do good in a world full of wrong, then Satan wants you on his side. And he's going to use that self-doubt against you. He's going to use your desires against you. He's going to use the people who are closest to you against you so that he can get you on his side. But guess what? God also wants you on his side. And he wants you even more than Satan does, right? And so he's calling you to stop listening to those voices and instead turn right in his direction. Because he, he loves you. We serve a God who loves you. Perhaps adjacent to God loving us enough that he would send his only son to die for us is the fact that God allows us to exist knowing that we are going to fail before it even happens. If I'm a creator of something or a producer of something and I know my product is going to fail, then why would I go through with it unless I really loved it, right? And that's the kind of God that we serve. He knows that we are inherently failures, yet he gives us the redemption that we need regardless of that. And that's a God that loves you. And so on this morning, I urge you to fight against self-doubt. I urge you to not put those, those, uh, those desires in front of God, but to let God lead you to those desires. Don't get it turned backwards, right? I urge you to watch the company that you keep around you, both good and bad, because both can lead you astray. Both of those can lead you astray. And that's what they don't tell you, right? And so on this morning, if you don't know Jesus, you come to him by hearing the gospel message, how he died for our sins. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us how he died and rose three days later with all power in his hands. And then in Romans 3, 23, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You have to be willing to believe that same message. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then once you believe, that belief should be so dominant that it drives you to repent of your sins, meaning you've come to a point of change of mind, which leads you to a change of action. It means you're going to have to sacrifice some things that you used to rely on. It means you're going to have to turn away from some of those desires that were leading you down the wrong path and instead turn in accordance with the will that God would have and the purpose that God would have for your life. And this is perhaps the hardest step of them all. Once you do this, you must then be willing to make the same confession 
that the eunuch made in Acts chapter 8 when he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And then you must be willing to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Mark 16, 16 says that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will be condemned. And then perhaps one of the hardest steps actually is we must live faithful until it is God, time for God to call us back home. And none of us know when that time is coming. It says he's going to come like a thief in the night. That means it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years or 10,000 years from now. The only time that is guaranteed is the time that you are having right now. And so I urge you to not wait until it is too late. Listen to the voice, the correct voice, God's voice on this morning. Ask yourself, are you really listening? And if you're not saved, then you are not listening. And I, I, I urge you to listen to that, that voice that's calling you to repent and devote your life to Christ. And so I encourage you to come forward if you're not saved. The water is ready. The only thing you have to do is say yes. Would you be willing to surrender to him today? Once again, I urge you to not wait until it is too late. With that, let's together stand and sing the Savior's invitation. And if you would like to be saved, just come forward. 613, are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusted in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? In the blood, in the, the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Question, are you washed? In the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the land, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the land?